So we left off last time we were talking about uh, magnetic particle inspection and we had gotten to um, particle concentration check. We kind of were talking about the process of doing this here. So just a quick reminder on that. The particle concentration is we have a suspension. We have uh, particles that are uh, we have particles that are suspended or mixed up in a liquid. They're not dissolved, however. Uh, and so we've got to keep it agitated in order for those particles to be distributed and, and evenly distributed. And so to do that, we have a pump running. We want to run that pump for roughly 10 to 20 minutes before we take a sample to get an accurate reading. And then we take a, a 100 milliliter sample in a centrifuge tube and allow that to settle for 60 minutes. Now, we don't have to necessarily wait until it's done settling to begin doing testing. For your labs, if it doesn't come out correct, which should be 0.2 to 0.4 milliliters of particles per 100 milliliters of solution, um, I won't make you redo it, but if you were working in an NDT lab, you have to adjust the particle concentration in, uh, in the bath and then redo any tests where it was at the wrong concentration. So again, that should settle out. Hopefully you get 0.2 to 0.4 milliliters per 100 milliliters. And if it's low, you won't have enough particles to get an accurate uh, indication. You may miss indications. If it's too high, uh, you can get so many particles clinging to things and just it'll just be such a high concentration that it can obscure uh, your ability to see things. Uh, so you, you need to record that, uh, basically test it once a day uh, or if you're in a high production environment, you may have to test it more often. And the reason for that is um, over time we get what's called draw out or draw down. And so every time we do a part, even though we demagnetize it and all that, there's still going to be particles stuck to it uh, when we're done testing it. You know, and then we're going to take that part and go to a cleaning tank to clean it off before we return it to service. Uh, and so those particles are going to go with the part out of the testing, uh, out of the test bench. And so over time, that concentration will drop down. So typically, we have to add additional particles. The carrier solution, the carrier fluid, uh, being oil-based, really doesn't evaporate. It doesn't have a, it, it, it's not prone to evaporation. We do cover our tank here just to keep stuff out of it and prevent, slow down the evaporation. Um, but the rate of evaporation is so slow that it's rare that you would have too much particles or too many particles unless you over add them when you're when you're when you're mixing the powder in which certainly can happen and if that's the case then you have to either add more fluid or drain off some of the fluid and particles and then add fluid to dilute it um, or another way I've heard of people doing it although I haven't done it is to take like a permanent magnet and kind of run it through the tank um, and so you'll get a lot of particles sticking to that magnet you can use that to kind of draw out the particles uh, to bring the concentration down as well, but then you'll have to test it and get it get it figured back out. So again, it looks like this, um, and you know, here's what we're looking for. In the case of this um, tube, these graduations are uh, 0.1 milliliters each. We have one tube that looks like this, so where the first tick mark there is 0.5, so you want to be between 0.2 and 0.4. Uh, we also have a version of the tube where the graduations this in this area in the skinny part of the tube here uh, are 0 0.05 and so you have to go 10 you know 10 graduations is 0.5 so you have to be be careful which tube you're using uh, and make sure you just double check which one you're using so that you know uh, so you can make sure you have the correct uh, particle concentration there so here's one that's settled and this one's right at the 0 0.3 milliliter mark for 100 milliliters of uh, solution. What kind of a review there? There are a couple ways that magnetism can be formed. So um, you can have equipment, you can have um, mag particle equipment that runs on either AC or DC, alternating current or direct current. Alternating current is the most common. Uh, the reason for this is the you know, the, the current that comes to our buildings, to our houses, um, is alternating current. And so it's very easy to just step that voltage up or down and step that current up or down using transformers uh, to do it. But there are some applications where we're having DC using a rectifier 
to turn AC into DC uh, can be an advantage because DC, DC current can result in deeper penetration of magnetism because it's not flipping back and forth. It can actually magnetize further into the part. And so there are times where um, you might use a DC bench uh, if you are in an environment where subsurface flaws are of concern. Um, but most equipment, I said not all equipment is DC capable. In fact, most equipment is not. Our test bench is not DC capable. Uh, when I was out in industry, I never worked with, we never had a bench anywhere I went that was DC capable. Uh, and then any of your prods or yokes, um, those run on AC, they, they aren't typically DC capable as well. But it's not saying it's not out there. Uh, it's just not nearly as common and definitely not common in aerospace. The main, the main thing we're looking for in aerospace is surface flaws. But why, what does that look like? So if we have a cross section of a magnetic part, um, this shows kind of the level of magnetism. So if you measure magnetism at a given distance from a part, um, it shows how that kind of curve works out. So the, the, the magnetic field is still going to be strongest at the surface of the part and then it's going to taper off as you um, as you move away from the surface it's also going to taper off if you were in theory able to work your way to the center but you can see it's a fairly linear taper uh, from the surface of the part to the center of the part right because then the field flips as you go from one side to the other so you've got this um, this line that runs again from from the surface to the center of the part, you can see it's fairly linear. Um, if we looked at the opposite side here, that line would continue continue linear at the same angle. Although I can't draw at the same angle with a mouse apparently. We can contrast that to what we are working with, and then, well, and then I should say the area outside the other surface. Uh, you can see how that drops off. Um, Approximately one radius away, it would be half the uh, half the magnetic field strength. So when you're using your Gauss meter, you want to you want to bring it pretty close to the surface of the part. Uh, when you get two two radii away, uh, it's going to be a third of the of the um, a third of the uh, strength that it would be at the surface. Uh, so that, but that's DC. If we look at the AC curve, you can see it's a lot steeper in both directions. So it, it drops off much quicker as you get away from the surface, whether you're moving towards the center of the part or moving out away uh, from the outer surface of the part. So again, kind of the takeaway there, no matter what you're doing, you would want to use um, your Gauss meter, bring the, the arrow you know, on your Gauss meter, there's an arrow, you want to bring that as close to the part as you can. Side by side, they look something like this. So you can see where that's a big difference. But um, you know, AC also does drop off faster as you move away from the outside of the part. But again, we're looking with AC, we're primarily looking for surface flaws. And so you have that same, relatively the same strength, same magnetic field strength at the surface, no matter if you're doing AC or DC. So it's really only if you're looking for subsurface that you need a DC, a DC equipment. <laughs> After we've done our inspection, we have to demagnetize our part. And the way we do that is um, we use the coil on the bench uh, to create a magnetic field. So we want to be able to essentially move the part. So uh, we can't do that if it's clamped in the head and tail stock. So we move the coil out to a portion of the bench where it's um, kind of clear of everything, move the tail stock out of the way, move the, move the coil to the middle of the bench. And then what we do is run the coil, typically about uh, half, um, half power, so about five or so on the scale, five or six using the dial control. Uh, and we're going to hold the part roughly centered in the coil. You would then press and hold the button on the test bench that, um, that activates the current flow in the coil and make sure your, your test bench is set for coil as well. And then as you're pressing and holding that, you're going to draw the part out and away from the coil, uh, essentially as far as you can. You know, small parts, that's pretty easy. You can bring it up and, and do the, the whole disco dancing thing where you, where you bring it up past your shoulder. 
bigger parts might be a little bit harder. Sometimes it helps to have a second person help you, especially if you're doing like a crankshaft or something like that. Um, but that, that withdrawing the part away from the magnetic field will collapse it and bring it back uh, to a neutral point. It'll re-scramble the orientation of, of those poles in the atom, so to speak. And we'll look at how that works here in just a second. Another way to do it is most test benches have the ability to demagnetize parts. And that is you can clamp a part in and they have a timer on them where with the part clamped in place, you put the coil around the part, you set the bench up as though it were, you know, to use the, the coil. And then there's a timer that you can set where it, where it turns down and it, it controls the current and automatically reduces the current in the coil, which reduces the magnetic field. So you can either reduce the magnetic field by physically pulling the part away from the coil, or you can have a timer that, that backs the current off in the coil, bringing the, the magnetic field down. That, however, is a very, it's a fairly slow process. Uh, it takes anywhere from 20 seconds to upwards of a minute sometimes to do that. And so it's often a lot quicker to do the first method where you just withdraw a part and you pull it away from the coil. Now you may have to do that a couple times uh, to fully demagnetize the part. And especially larger parts, uh, like again, a crankshaft example, you would put one end of it in and then draw it away and then flip it around to the other end, draw it away. And you might do that two or three times. And then what you're gonna do then is, is get your Gauss meter back out and you wanna check the part over and make sure nothing, it doesn't have any areas that remain magnetized. And if you find a, an area that remains magnetized, it's just a simple matter of uh, performing the demagnetization process a couple more times. That's especially, uh, true for hardened steel parts. So remember hardened steel uh, has a high retentivity. It wants to hang on to that magnetic field. It's harder to magnetize in the first place, but then it wants to stay magnetized. Uh, and so when you're doing hardened steel parts, crankshafts, camshafts, um, valves, uh, connecting rods, connecting rods to some extent, they're usually not quite as hardened. They're case hardened typically. Um, you would, things that have a high wear potential uh, you might have to do this a few times to to get the to get it back to that demagnetized state. The theory behind this goes back to our flux curve, our our um, uh, our flux curve and our hysteresis loop that it forms. And so, what you can see here is is this is working from the outer uh, to the inner. And so, you know, we start with a part that's at its um, it's retent, you know, it's showing a, a certain amount of retained magnetism here, right? It's when we shut current off, it's not at the saturation point, but but B positive here where I've highlighted would be where your part might start. It could be the negative side too. Um, it would be the area where your part would start when you've performed the test. And you can see as the current, you know, and the current's shown at the bottom. You know, that AC current decays or, you know, one way to make it decay and, and get smaller and smaller is just to physically pull the part away from the electromagnet that's causing it. Uh, you're going to reach, you're not going to reach the saturation point each time. So, you know, that first pass, you'll reach the saturation points. But then as that current decays, you're not going to quite saturate it as much. It's not going to reach a true saturation point. And that, and it'll continue to decay. And again, this is happening as you draw your part out. It'll continue to kind of go back and forth here, following this until it settles at that center point and becomes demagnetized again. So this is why it may take a couple passes, uh, because depending on how much you know how retentive the material is it may, you know, the amount that it reduces on each cycle here uh, would get, you know, would be less on a more retentive part. So it would take more passes, more cycles of reducing um, current and reducing flux density to get that part back to a non-magnetic state. 